my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Essa Serena De Nepi, um, who um, uh, teaches at the Sapienza uh, in Rome, uh, who has a forthcoming book on the Jewish, the life of the Jews in Rome after 1555, that is after ghettoization. Um, uh, she uh, has worked with uh, both uh, Marina, Di Ca Marina Capiero and uh, Anna um, Esposito. Uh, Esposito, yes, yes, thank you. I, I shouldn't introduce anybody because I can't remember anybody's names, <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, and she and I have, uh, in fact, been working on some texts, some Roman texts together. And without further ado, uh, Dr. Inepi. Okay. Oh, and she has lovely children, too. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I want to thank uh, Bernie because he helped me to edit my English translation. I apologize for my English, I do my best, but I'm just a bit nervous. Uh, with this paper, we are going far from the history of mentalities, the big ideas, the literature, the Kabbalah, and we are going on the ground. I choose um, to investigate a single case uh, a trial recorded in the Ar State Archive of Rome in the Tribunale Criminale del Governatore. Uh, before, uh, let's begin with a very brief introduction on this kind of sources uh, and uh, on the aim of my presentation. Assuming that, as uh, yesterday Professor Davis told us, uh, Italian towns were violent, and violence in Italy was uh, a normal phenomenon. It was not stranger, it was not unusual. Violence is a daily life. Daily life was violent, we have violence in a various form, but everything is violent. It's not strange to deal with violence. I decided to turn to the ghetto and to check how was this violence in the ghetto. Are the Jews were the Jews violent as other people? Is this violence between Jews, among Jews, different from the violence we know about Christian society, or it's the same? How do the Jews deal with the violence as institution, as a Jewish institution, in, so in the particular context of early modern Italian towns? We remember that there are the ghettos, and that even the ghetto was a, a form of violence against Jews. The ghetto where the ghettos were built to convince Jews to convert. So this is the big context. And in this big context, my aim is to explore the manifestation of violence in the ghetto as a daily phenomenon, uh, and to explore the way by which Jews deal with this violence. Uh, my methodology is uh, um, centered on the analysis of uh, Christian sources recorded as a trial. Let's say something about the jurisdiction context in Rome and about the words of Roman, tribal tri um, of Roman courts in this period. As everybody, I suppose, know, there are different courts in Rome that have, ju that have jurisdiction over the Jews. The most important were the Vicario's court, and the Vicario is the Cardinal of Rome, who had the jurisdictions over religious things in the, in this, in the town. <coughs> uh, such a just for in time, Vicario had jurisdiction over weddings, uh, over contexted weddings, even uh, over nuns, and even over Jews as uh, people of the town. So when Jews had the problems, uh, with other Jews, it's a normal way to do, to go to the Vicario and to ask for a solution and for an intervention by the Vicario. This is one. Other one very important court, this is our court in this trial, is the court of the governor of Rome. Of course, a, any uh, court in Rome is an ecclesiastical court. There is no lay, <laughs> no lay court in Rome. Uh, the Tribunale Criminale del Governatore, Criminal uh, Court of the Governor of Rome, deals uh, with any criminal cases occurred in Rome and in the neighborhood of Rome in a distance of 40 miles from the town. 
but also it works as a court of appeal for events occurred far away from Rome, such as Ancona, Bologna, or even Ravenna, in the big papal state. Then there is another one very important court that everybody knows, that is the Inquisition court. The Inquisition court in Rome worked as the central court uh, uh, to which any question occurred all over the world were referred. We have not for Rome the uh, records of inquisitional works of the office of Rome because it was the vicario and the criminal uh, archive of the vicario hasn't arrived to us. It's disappeared. And so we can't. But we have the records of the Holy Central Inquisition, of the Holy Sant'Uffizio. And those records, it's important to be remembered that every time were record in Rome. So people who were dealing, car uh, cardinals who were dealing with something, with any topics, they were dealing it in Rome, referring to the Rome reality that they knew. And uh, considering this reality as a point of paragon, a, a comparison between this reality and the question they are dealing with. Maybe the question could came from Brazil, from uh, India, from uh, other Italian towns, from uh, Spain. So it's important. The Jews were very able to deal in this riddle of codes because they knew where to go for any kinds of different problems. So usually they use the Inquisition Court as a court of appeal after questions uh, arising in the vicar court or in the tribunal uh, or in the governor court or even in the senatore court, that is the court of the local administration, the municipal authority of Rome. Not only when we, are, when we deal <coughs> with the question connected to criminal events in the tribunal, in the court of the governor of Rome, we must remember that uh, we have archives uh, uh, split into different fragments. We have the real trials, such as these cases I present you today, but we have a lot of other ways to record the questions presenting in the same archive. We, the most important among these are the constituti, because not all the constituti are the examination of witnesses about any kind of things. We have a lot of books of register of constituti for any year, but just a few parts of this became real trials. So if you want to know something about the real daily life of the town of Rome, in Rome, I mean, in its streets, places, markets, uh, we need to go to the constituti, keeping in mind that constitute we have maybe 10 books of constituti for any years, while we have just two or three big <laughs> records of trials. It's a very dif difficult, it's a very hard way to do because constituti were recorded by different notaries, and it's not any time easy to understand which notary we need to check. Okay, just not to get, uh, so how, where does this tribunale criminale del governatore it, f it deals with the criminal e events occurred in Rome, and it's split in the different archival s files. You have trials, you have constituti, that is another archival se serie, I don't know how to translate, Sorry. serie. Yes, this is the big file with Tribunale Criminale del Governatore, split in different parts. Trials, okay. constituti, that is widest, Sentence, that means sentences, and it must be uh, it must be noticed that not even all all the trial has a sentence, but not all the sentences were recorded in the sentence uh, in the sentences file. And how is this uh, governatore related to the guy? It's different jurisdiction. It's different jurisdiction. Different jurisdiction. Historiography say, historiography, but also contemporary uh, ancient uh, essayists, uh, ancient scholars say that generally vicario deals with spiritual questions. Okay, generally. And governor deals with criminal questions, and the senatore 
or Camerlengo, that another one deals with civil question, but it's not exactly this. Inside, in the Tribunale Criminale del Governo, you can find any kind of things, from homicide, uh, to theft, to uh, questions regarding, sometimes questions regarding uh, uh, quarrels about um, wills. Everything is possible. To, uh, if you want to understand something about what's happening in a, in a precise period in Rome, it's a good idea to start from this kind of records and to check this with, and to cross these records with other kinds. But it, it's an idea of what was daily life. Uh, if you have a lot of time to spend, it's an idea to go to the archive and ask for the Costituti and begin just to read. <laughs> because there is everything inside this. So let's go to the sentences. Sentences, not all, not all sentences were recorded in sentence file as a single sentences, but it's often they were just noted in other records called registrazione dati, that is the general records of the office, of the mm, offices of this court. For instance, uh, uh, both the sentences of the two trials that I present you today, the trial for suspect ma for murder investigation and the other trial for eccessi, had sentences only in the registrazioni dati and not are, in, and are not recorded as a single sentence. Moreover, you have some other interesting issues like the relazione dei birri, the relationship of police, the relationship of, of um, physicians, and some other little possibility to find interesting questions. So if you want to understand a single trial in the Roman context in this court, you must check all over different files in this big archive. And it's not, uh, uh, you, it's not easy and it's not uh, successful because not everything, especially for the 16th century, has arrived to us. But a lot of things uh, have disappeared throughout the centuries, of course. Uh, why I uh, decided to deal with the violence among Jews starting from a Christian sources? I could, of course, prefer use Hebrew sources, because we have Hebrew sources in Italy. We have Hebrew sources for Rome in the, in the archive of the Jewish community of Rome. The answer is easy, as, and, that, and that is connected with the fact that violence questions and criminal questions are always uh, <coughs> uh, are always dealt by the Christian courts. But it's impossible to consider violence as a only a Jewish questions that the Jewish authorities could manage. Violent questions, even if it is a brawl, just a fight, or just a knife, even if there is no assassination, no homicide, is always matter for criminal court and Christian court in Rome. It's not a matter for under uh, for not real jurisdiction as juris uh, Roman Jewish jurisdiction was. So what would the Roman Jewish, because that sounds very modern, right? When Jews are part of a state structure and not... Uh, Jews uh, were out... The Jews were autonomous uh, for uh, questions connected to be Jewish, made and not totally autonomous. They use a particular way to do that is arbitrate, to govern themselves, uh, to manage themselves. And reading between the lines of the Sabato trials, we have uh, a guess on this uh, way to, to manage themselves by arbitration, by agreement written by Jewish notaries in Rome. But for the big things, uh, they need to go to outside court. And they, they used to go to the vicario <coughs> even for uh, question connected to be Jewish, uh, maybe wedding or maybe ritual uh, questions between scholar. And you must even you must remember that starting from the end of the 16th century, after the um, important bull 
called Antiqua Judeorum in Probitas, the Inquisition had an, op an, an open eye on Jewish question and on questions called, question, called Jure Comunia between Jews and Christians. The Inquisition has jurisdiction over Jews starting from 1586 and then from 1591, saying that Inquisition could check what Jews think, think and what Jews do because there are some things that are, com com that are common between Jews and Christians. And so the Inquisition could check over Jews' matters and over Jews' behavior as Jews. But this is a later period, just a later period. Uh, so, just a few words on the case I presented. This is the case, uh, <coughs> this is an investigation, something like CSI we can say, for a dead <coughs> occurred in the ghetto. The authorities found uh, a body near the river to, near the gate to the river, and after finding this body, it was necessary to understand what happened before. And the night before this body was found, there was a big quarrel in the ghetto streets that involved different parts, different people. We uh, can read something about this wall directly from the words of the accused person who was Sabato del Corsetto, son of Angelo di Piperno that presented himself to the court. It's interesting to note the dates because this process, this, the trial was on October 15. The dead was discovered at the beginning of August. And during all this time, so from the beginning of, of August to the mid of October, Sabato was simply disappeared. <laughs> he knew that police was looking for him and he went out to avoid to be captured. Probably he, say, and he said some page, he said that he stayed in Rome in this period, but of course he didn't stay in the ghetto. He was out of the ghetto, probably helped by a network of Christian friends or Neophyte friends. And it's interesting to know, to, to notice this. Even it's interesting to notice that it is in a part that I not uh, presented in this uh, few pages that he said that if I was, he, he told to the cow that if I was guilt, I flew, I escaped to Turkey, and I did not remain in Rome. It's interesting to notice that every time for Jews persecuted, for Jews who had problems, there are two possible ways to solve their problems. One is converting to Christianity, and the other one is to flee away. And it's interesting to notice that <coughs> neither Corsetto in this trial, neither the gang of the Jews presenting in the second trial decided to convert or to go away. It's interesting to notice, just say this. If we uh, read the word of Sabato himself, page 100, we have a <coughs> glimpse on the daily violence of the ghetto. If we read it, he said that there was a struggle, a struggle among women in the morning or in the middle or in the beginning of the afternoon between his sister and another woman, and that they dragged for hair. That means they, it was a typical <laughs> women violence. The women were able to cut the other one by hair. In Italian, is scapigliare. It is very hard to translate. You must imagine, uh, it's like watching a movie, you must imagine two different women who are dragging each other by hair. So this is the first violence events described by, by Corsetto. Then the honor of the family was questioned, so he decided to intervent, and he had another brawl with the brother of the other woman involved. And now they go, they switch to verbal violence. From the physical violence of the women, we are switching to verbal violence. They insulted each other, and then they began to bump, to bump. And at then, one of the two, uh, the, the enemy of Sabato, ran, and he ran after him. At the moment, you, at this moment, you ma at this moment, they were everybody were running. It's probable, it's probably that uh, uh, Sabato 
hearted the man who will die in the next few hours. He doesn't remember about this. But he was, and while he was still running, he was stopped by his own wife. So he bumped against his own wife. Other women came to, her, came to help the, wi the, wi the, the wife, and he started again to run. Then he was finally stopped. And in this uh, normal situation, um, look at the page with a moment. Uh, look at page 100 at the hand. He said that, uh, OK, there was a quarrel. Uh, they had some problems, but uh, he, he bumped against his own wife. But then everything was normal. He went home. He understood that someone had bumped into Rubino Rochetto, and he had a normal dinner, dinner with his family. Because of violence, she, yeah, she was willing to say, that's no matter, she can cook, of course. <laughs> <laughs> She's a Jewish woman, she has no, mm, no problem. <laughs> she can cook and everything is normal. He can, go, he can come back to his home and begin a normal day, a normal evening with his family, his beloved family. It's very funny how she said, punched my wife who was trying to stop me and just made a little blood uh, come out of my mouth and I told her to be quiet. <laughs> 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 and the, Ita the Italian version is, is better. It's impossible to translate the, cor the, the taste of the Italian of 16th century. He says something very beautiful word. <laughs> no, that's very interesting because it's the same thing in my document. It starts with the women. It's, it's actually, I mean, if we it's women folk that it's not so unusual in the Roman ghetto. If you look uh, on the um, famous uh, poems written, by, uh, written at the beginning of the 20th century in uh, Judaico Romanesco, that is the language of Roman Jews, and it's a mix of uh, it's a mix of uh, Rome, of, Itali of ancient Italian and Hebrew. Uh, there is a famous poem that is. Uh, entitled Donne, Donne Aregeteme, that means do, women <coughs> block me, stop me, and it's about a quarrel between women. It's not strange, but of course it was connected when there is a quarrel between women, it was questioned the honor of the family. It's shameful. And yes? But it's all, all because of honor. So she's stopping make him being less honorable it looks like it could it could looks like a question of honor, but if you read between the lines, just a few words away, you understood that the question is not honor; it's a job question. Yeah, okay. it's a job question no, but because it became. yeah, the, the the real reason of the difficult position in which Sabbath was was a question of job because what was market? There are few job the few few job. Leg legal for Jewish people. In those few jobs, there is a big uh, concurrence uh, competition, with, uh, competition. competition among Jews. And he decided to begin a new work that some other people was dealing, and he was punished for him for this. If you look carefully, the document I presented, page uh, with a Page 100, 103, he said that he, be, he, he, be, he began to work this new job, and the other people weren't, were not happy for the, his decision. And he described a, a violent reaction to his decision. He said that um, he, he had been assaulted with gun and he, he had been searched in his house by, by another by a gang of Jewish people and so he decided to go to the vicar as I said uh, as I told this is it was the first step of a legal de debate of a legal dispute of, uh, to go to the vicar and to present a problem the vicar uh, the, the, the vicar in the vicar did not have time to intervene because the Jewish intervened. And he said, another time we are guessing among li between lines, 
He say, I am in their company for the next two years and we have to be in company. It means that someone among Jewish society obliged him and the, re and the, re the competitor to be, in the to be partners for a little space of time to resolve their question and to act as partners. Probably, but I, have no, I'm, I was not able to find it, I checked, but I, not, I didn't find it. There is an, agre an agreement recorded by a Jewish notary in this time. We have Jewish notary in Rome, and it's interesting to say, to notice that uh, we can hear the voice of one future Jewish notary in this trial, because uh, his, mm, they interview also Pompeo del Borgo. Pompeo del Borgo was the first Jewish notary in Rome who began to write, not in Hebrew, but in uh, Italian, his records. We have his first uh, record are of uh, 1578, so we are just a few years before he began his work as a rabbi and as a notary. It's interesting to notice how he's involved in question connected to lower people, to, yes? But in, in case of competition, or in case of the stuff that could have ended up in a, rab in a rabbinical, or uh, as a, you know, could be a, a question for response to so this kind of uh, stuff would be also recorded by the notary, because you know often notary would not go would go into the you know a simple first. This simple, kind of stuff. this kind of stuff are recorded in the not okay. in the notary, but it, you can find this kind of stuff also in the Christian notary, okay. because you are in Rome and the Jews were very able to deal even with, w to deal both with Christian and Jewish so, authority. So, so if you have two Jews and they are they're having a, a case uh, related to a competition, they go to a rabbinical court or to Bet Din, then the, the, the decision, it would be recorded by the notary? It's, it, it is one of the possibilities. Okay. It depends by which they decided to do. They could go to the Bet Din, to the arbitrate, but they are not obliged to do this. They even could decide that they, they prefer to go to the vicar, to go to the governor, to go if they are bankers to the chamberlain, or to go to the inquisition himself just a period mm -hmm. later. It, 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 I'm just going to interrupt for a second. It's important to understand that in Rome there is no bed You go and create a bed Yes. Yeah. The community doesn't but, have. But, yeah, but, but, it, but, do you, but would you have a personal uh, rabbinical, I mean, like in, yes, in you can hate. You, mean you have a response of a, of a No, right. you can hate. Okay, so you can hate an arbitrary. So sure. There's okay. a difference between it's a standing rabbinical yeah, court and an ad hoc process, which mm -hmm. seems to be the case okay. here, which means that very often there's nobody who keeps a record. Okay. Which okay. means that the enforcement of whatever decision they make right. is. No. You haven't a bad dinner room. You have the possibility okay. to create an arbitrate, an arbitrate with three people judging. Yeah. Now but it's three different. People, are they judging by Allah or are they judging they, by Allah? That's Christ negotiated. That's yeah. negotiated yeah. up front. Yeah. So they and are you, notarize, you notarize what the system is that you're going to use. Usually and they judge balancing halakha and local laws of Rome. They are very they are very careful to this. And it's interesting to notice that we have some trials, not a lot of trials, where Jews, rabbis, and notaries testified about their records. One is the most famous uh, Forno case, and that, is, uh, that deals about, we are in the 1530, and then f the last record are about 1555. It's a 30 years history and the deals with a will, and the question arises in the days of the Roman Sacco, 1527. It's the story of the death of a lot of people, of course, <laughs> and particularly of the death of a human and her son. The question is if, who is to understand who was the first to, get, to die? if the woman or the son, and so there is an inheritance question. Mm -hmm. And the Jewish rabbi who was Leone delle Piattelle went to the court and testified ex uh, showing his own records, and the court said that his own records in Hebrew are legal and are valid to solve the question. 
So w it's interesting to notice that Pompeo del Borgo, who will be in the next few years one of the Jewish notaries and who will be particularly involved with questions connected to banks, uh, to mercants, uh, to uh, commercial and trading activity, at this moment was not a notary, was not a rabbi, was one of the people involved in a, one of the daily life uh, questions of the Roman ghetto. Can I ask a question? Yes. You're talking about two types of law. There's uh, the halakha and there's what you might refer to as common law. Local law. Local law. Rome. Local law. Uh, is, this, is this Roman Roman law in the uh, you know, uh, classic sense of the term or not? Yeah, it, it's based on it's the Roman law on classic sense of the, of the word, but it changed for, uh, oh. during the centuries. Because it's a, yeah, it's based on Roman law or canonical law. Okay, so uh, the reason I mention it, and I mentioned this, is that we, we when we have the typology of, of violence uh, that Bob mentioned yesterday, but we haven't talked really about the conceptual history of violence mm -hmm. in the course of the early modern period. And it seems to me that the um, uh, perception of Roman law has to be taken into consideration because in Roman law there's some very interesting uh, differentiation between what the stars between it's called violence for the, for the sake of argument that takes place in the house versus the violence of the state. Um, it's it's easy to use the word violence at all. Yes, yes, it's I, interesting to refer to the very important distinction. Yes, it's very in important. Different legal systems, the but violence where it takes place, how to understand it, how to punish it, how to solve it. Yes. Uh, in the, in the the discussion with Angela, the, uh, or about Angela, in the Italian version, there's there's actually a, a contract which isn't didn't somehow get translated. Uh, can you see? On page one ten at the in the middle, Charlie Noich de do contrato, paper due alien for him was executed. Wait a moment. I just all I wondered was this is it's not mentioned in the English one, but. Where would a contract like that be? I'm looking for Italian. Where is it? 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 Where is I, uh, so, so I, it's sort of been relative to no, the no, the, the contract is the agreement, uh, according to me. You don't think there's a written contract? No, I think it's a written contract. Well, uh, so I'm just asking, where would that contract be? I think it's a written contract, and I think it could be in the Jewish notaries. Mm -hmm. okay. Bec and I think this because if it was a contract in front, in the office of a Christian notary, normally he would say the name of the notary. And he doesn't. He didn't say this name, so I guess, but it's a guess, uh, that it could be in the Jewish notary. Mm -hmm. I checked in Stowe publication, but Stowe stopped it before. Oh. <laughs> uh. He only went to 1554. Yes. If he, usually when people went to the Christian notary and then have had the trouble in front of a court, they say the name of the Christian notary. He didn't say so. I guess that is a, a solution found inside the Jewish society, and of course, uh, in the Jewish notarial, notarial acts. I guess, I guess I was wondering if this contract is, is somehow in conformity with Roman law. They are usually private contract, uh, and they say in that uh, those contracts will be valid in front of a Christian court, but they are usually a private agreement and with a lot of single clues about single questions. Maybe we have, a, we have a, this kind of contracts for people uh, who um, decide to be partners for a company of banking, decide to... No, I was going to add that in the, in the Hebrew notarial records that Serena and uh, Kenny and, and my <coughs> others have worked on, there are a lot of these kinds of contracts. And these are personal contracts that are simply notarized by the Jewish notary in Hebrew, or it can, could be in a Christian contract. And they're, they're binding agreements between the two 
people on it's a business arrangement. Yeah, because this, I mean, it's relative to what you were saying. This, this is a this contract is is the result of violence. I mean, essentially, this guy was forced into this contract. To yes, agree, according to me. Yes. Agree not to work on his own. He's been. There's, there's kind of a yeah, but, mafia action here. But, but again, no. the, the, the question of because he was forced, the question by whom? It might have been. Uh, um, um, uh, it might have been arbitration on the question of encroachment on on the livelihood, because we have it uh, in, in the in the, in Poland, Lithuania, when when it, when, it, when you have been a rabbinical and also Christian sources that fight over arenda, leasing right. the then you often have that the arbitrary court forces two litigants to share the contract or to uh, give up the co contract, it depends. So, well, and you, you have this rubbing principle of encroachment on the livelihood, and then they can be forced to... Well, but Sabato was chased around by a guy with a pistol. That seems to be the force involved. Uh, there's no mention of an arbitrator, but that's there is the mention point. of a guy with a pistol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. 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 Okay. No, but, but, it's that move, isn't it, from a from a failed uh, way of enforcing business practice into violence? How common is that in the sources you've looked at? Is this a is this a common phenomenon that we've seen here, or is this a case that you found? No, it's a com I, 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 my my point is that it's a common phenomenon. Sounds like he was forced into an agreement. He didn't want yes, to they are forced. Yeah. The Jewish society was a strange place. They will be <laughs> careful. <laughs> to avoid too much intervention from outside, inside the ghetto. Mm -hmm. It's not simple, it's not easy, because Jews were used to go outside to solve their question. And my point in the upcoming quote is that the Jewish rabbi and the Jewish notaries played a role in this struggle to, to, to keep the question inside the ghetto. And the rabbi and the notar Jewish notary played a role in this. They could force people to find an agreement. We have uh, many cases about taxation on this. We have many cases about competition of this. We have many cases about uh, the correct way to manage a company, a, ma a financial company. It's interesting to notice that they are not obliged to go to the rabbinical arbitrate, but uh, they used to do. So where does violence play? What's the role of violence in that legal struggle that's going on? The role of vi violence is daily violence. Right. And people were violent. People, just as the Roman were right. violent people. But it's and being used for a purpose here. I mean, people are violent because there's violence. But this isn't just random violence. This is violence in for the pursuit a of a economic purpose. Yes. Also, isn't he being framed? He's being framed for the death of this respectable elderly gentleman, framed these. Uh, I don't know he's put in that frame. No, right? uh, he's falsely accused. He's falsely accused. They yes, falsely accused. Yes, this is the second. Yes. Later on, someone who does this exactly. This is the second trial. Yes. This exactly. is the second trial. Exactly. Just Magda? a quick question um, about the guns. Okay. Let's talk about guns and using guns. Um, what? Uh, where, what were the sort of legal parameters of Jews' ownership of guns? Because According to the law, they are forbidden to have yeah, guns. It's very, very matter of fact. You know, <laughs> he ran with me with a gun, and did you ever use a gun? Oh, I would never shoot anyone. It's not like I don't <laughs> have a gun, and I don't know what you're No, 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 no. It's, like, it's a matter of fact because you are in the governor court. You are not in inquisition court. It's the governor court who deals with matter of facts. According to the law, Jews are absolutely forbidden to have, for forbidden every, for to everybody. have, to, for every, yeah. Not just for Jews, for everybody. Yes, but uh, they had. Sure. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I understand that this is just part of, uh, of the proceedings and we don't have all the material here, right? And it's interesting because it, it goes about all these disputes among these uh, Yes, the, 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 prof the profession. Yes, but it never gets how possibly there is. I think that Rubino means Melamed, right? It's a, it's a Rubino, it's a, according to me and to the usual Italian source, Roman source, it's Ruben. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I 
but he never gets. Oh, he is. We, we're, we're having an argument about. It. I think Rubino is the Roman word for rabbi, and because he's a teacher. Because he mentioned he, that he's called Rufi, he's the yeah. teacher for the uh, for the kids. Yeah, yeah, he was a teacher. He was a teacher, yeah. but we had bankers uh, recorded in the Christian sources as Rubino, and um, usually the Christian ro writers uh, try to understood the strange name of the Jews and to translate he that name in a way they could understand. So he was not skinning animals anyway. No, Rubino no. And how was it's not very clear what his how is it implicated or he was just killed by accident mm -hmm. Probably he was killed by accident. He was very old. They say he was very old. And you know by uh, thanks to the third documents that he had a will he was old, he was probably not so in good uh, health condition. And me, my, my, my idea, but it's, it's just a guess, is that he was working and then he felt and then he wasn't able to stand up, he was ill and he died. They say that nobody found uh, signs of violence on his body. Yes, uh, he was a teacher, he was teaching to the kids. It was not so poor. If you look to, mm, no, this is my, my last point. Just uh, <laughs> go to the second document, to the second trial. That is uh, interesting for uh, many, many questions. He is a very big trial, more than 100 pages uh, uh, in, the, um, uh, in the register. It's a big trial against a lot of people uh, charged for eccessi. The word eccessi means everything that uh, involves a lot of different crimes. Here we have false witnesses, we have thefts, we have people, Jews people going out of the ghetto during the night, uh, we have struggles, and uh, it's interesting to notice that only two of these people, the two most important people who were condemned and were condemned to exile at the hand of the, of the trial. Th this trial went out after, uh, <coughs> after a particular crime that is a crime only if committed by Jews because the police found one Jew out of the ghetto during the night in, a, in one of the neophytes, in a, a home of the of a neophytes of a neophyte, neophyte, oh, neophyto. They interviewed him, asking him, uh, you are Jews, do you know that you couldn't stay out of the ghetto during the night? And he answered, yes, I'm in this, this house of one, of one of my relatives because I want to know something about conversion. <laughs> and then he came back to the ghetto, just to notice. And he did it convert. They, uh, while the investigation go, goes on, they understood that it's a deal connected to different questions. One of the questions was uh, gambling. One of the other questions was the necessity to pay for gambling them, to pay for the gambling debts, and the idea had by this group of Jewish who were all young Jewish boys that uh, decided to go to the house of the richest in the ghetto during the Friday evening do, and uh, to steal everything they can kept from the house of riches and of course in, Friday, in Shabbat evening they went around the ghetto, out of the ghetto and they uh, sell the stuff they steal and then they come back to the ghetto. It's a wonderful thing. <laughs> And yeah, in the attempt to raise enough money to pay for the uh, for the gambling debts, they also uh, used to make a racket of false witnesses. And this is the case about whom, after his own trial, Sabato testified in front of the court. It's interesting to notice that if the first trial was totally about real violence people who struggle against other people, brawls, a dead, a murder, a, a, a suspect murder. This other trial is about uh, something like bullshit. It's about uh, psychological violence. <laughs> it's psychological violence. 
There is intimidation. a intimidation, yes, a bullism. <laughs> Wait a moment. And that uh, this is uh, uh, the occasion for Sabbath to get revenge against his own enemies. We can imagine it, Sabbath very happy, Sabbath very happy to say another time in front of the court and to say the trust about his ancient enemies. And he describes a world, a society, a Jewish society where the where there are networks, family networks, friendship networks, and where it's not easy to survive inside because you have to deal with the different way to be enemies and different people. But another time it's interesting to say that nobody of the people involved in this trial decided to convert. And conversion could be the solution of any problem. If they convert, the question will be solved very fast. Nobody converted, and the two people condemned to exile went out of the, ta of the city, went out of the papal state, probably uh, to northern Italy or maybe to the Ottoman Empire. We, do, we haven't traced it, so it's impossible to follow them out of Rome, but it's interesting to notice that they do not convert. And here there is my third document and my point, that is probably the begin, one of the possible beginning of all the story in front of the court. We are just a few days after the founding of, uh, the finding of uh, Rubino Rossetto body, and they do not speak about this. It, we know from the Sabato trial, from the Sabato trial that uh, uh, in these days, the police was looking for Sabbath, and that the Sabbath was impossible to find, that nobody knows where is it, and that the police is conducting an investigation for murder. But they didn't say anything about this. This is the files to, of, the investi of the investigation and of the denunciation to that court. And we can see in this file, this last file, the way, the, the way to do and the action of the Jewish institution in front of the possible arise of problems. We have the Gemilut Hasadim with the company of the Dart of the Roman Ghetto. We have the gossip about a treasure hidden inside Rubi, uh, Rubino home. And we have the notice of a will, but it's just a new, a news noted in the tri in the document. So what do they did? They go they went to the home to the Gemelut Hasadim representatives and four of the relatives of the dead went to the dad's home to the and they began to find to look for the treasure. Even if the relatives didn't expect to find anything, they find the treasure, it's not so few amount of money because a 97 gold scudi is an interesting uh, uh, it is an interesting uh, uh, amount of money it's not so yes yeah, so you you must remember that in this time to rent a play for a Jews to rent a place uh, in the best most important market of the town that is the Mercato of Piazza Navona it's about 10 golden scudi for a year. And it's a very important business. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you must remember that to buy the monopoly of um, used clothes by the hospitals in Rome in this time, that is one of the way by which Jews can, could work. It's about 50 scudi for a year. So 97 scudi is an interesting amount of money. They found it, this, and immediately the company decided how to deal, to what to do with this money, with this unexpected money. They do not question, so they say, about the inheritance of this money. They only wanted to school for the company. And then, in a, according with the relatives, they decided to put this, mo to, uh, put this moment, to deposit this moment in the bank of one of the most important Jewish bankers of the time, that is Angelo Di Capua. 
and to uh, resolve the question inside the Jewish society, um, they decided to go to the, to the court just to inform that they find the money, that they have a solution, that there is no problem, just to avoid problems if some of the relatives decided to go against the company of the death. And they find a way to manage this. This is, according to me, in my opinion, this is one of the ways by which a Jewish institution try to manage an, a difficult society and difficult people such as Roman Jews was at the time. They had daily violence, they had daily struggles for works, they had daily struggle for honor, there are violence connected to every aspect of daily life, of normal life, connected to lower people, but also to people not so in the lower strate of the society, such as Pompeo del Borgo. And we, we know that he will be a writer and a rabbi and a notary, so he is not uh, one of the people uh, bel belonging to the lower strate of the society. What do they do? They try to balance between internal power, internal question, internal problems, and external powers and external innovation. And it's interesting to note this kind of behavior, the, this way to survive the, the ghetto and its problem, also in a simple case study like this. Thank you. The first thing. In, the, in this case of the wall uh, money, uh, could the family uh, appeal against it? Because it seems like. Uh, the family could appeal against them, but they did uh, this uh, step uh, to protect themselves uh, against this kind of idea by the family. Because they say that he left some will, but they never uh, produced the will. No, it's, this is, uh, uh, you must come back to the sources as to the kind of source this is. This is an investigation. It means that you can go to the court and to tell your story, any kind of story, and then the court decided if proceed or not to proceed. This is not a story about who, which proceed. It's a kind of protection against the decision of the family to make something more. So if the family wants, wanted something more, wanted a real trial, want, want to litigate it, they could show these documents, say, but we inform the governor, and there is no, there were no problem. You, you began with a very interesting, I think, difficult proposition of comparing the types of violence and the amount of violence in the ghetto as opposed to what's going on outside the ghetto. I'm wondering how you would address that problem over your methods. <laughs> That's a good question. Because <laughs> uh, I think they have to be statistics. Uh, we, ha we had no statistics. As uh, yesterday, Professor Davis said, we have the index of the uh, of this count in the Roman State Archive. But we must remember that the index is, the index is partial. It doesn't so register. No, we had so some. No, we had essays about this by Irene Fosi, mm -hmm. who st studied the banditi in the Roman context of this time, and who studied the criminal courts of Roman in this time, but we had not statistics. In this moment, there are a lot of, there are many scholars in Italy investigating different way of different context of violence, including clerical violence, uh, um, such as like this. So just to continue, so I think one way is statistics. Uh, one, one way is the flow sociological, which means to take in some kind of modern typology of violence, see who is doing what to whom, and so on and so forth. And then there's, once again, the conceptual issue. What is considered violence? Under what system? And how these systems change over time? Uh, violence inside the house is not the same as violence in the street depending on the system, and this changes in the course of the early month period. So you're talking about methodology, I think the conceptual part just has to be I think that it's not my work, and uh, it's just a guess. 
it could be interesting for this to go to the, Inquis to the Inquisition archives because this kind of source conceptualizes a lot. They think about what they are doing and what they are dealing with. And uh, it's interesting to notice that the Roman Inquisition often protect women, even inside, protect women and kids even inside the walls of the home. And it's, it's probably different the, for the possible conceptualization if we are looking to simple criminal sources or to, uh, or to religious sources such as Inquisition. And we can make a different portrait of our society according to the filter we use to look at it. Just one point on page one or two. The question about Pompeo when the uh, is interrogated and is asked, do you think that Pompeo was a man of bad disposition or reputation? And the answer is so candy. He says, I think that all the Jews are priests. Yeah. Yes, it's Which very... It's not necessarily sad, right? It could be miserable. It could be... Christy has a, yeah. almost a moral context. It's a moral context. Yes, I, I forgot to tell this, but of course, this is his narrative and this is a process strategy. But still, right? Yes. What is the strategy? The strategy, the strategy is, is to depict it. The strategy is to say we're all miserable people, except my father. <laughs> <laughs> I think crazy. that this is a strategy oh, to depict himself as humble, as poor, as unlucky. He wants to stay, and maybe we can make a connection with all the things we heard before me. He's, he's trying to stay inside the, Jew, the representation of Jewish people. And is, this is his narrative, because we are in a trial, and he had a name. He wants to be proved innocent. So he used to depict his society as a violent society, as a society in which those kinds of things are normal, and it's normal to be imprisoned, it's normal everything, because they are sad people. But that is one of those moments that you can use to go back to your beginning question. How yes. do we measure the violence within the ghetto compared to the violence within the ghetto, right? So this, this kind of strategy is precisely something that we can use. Yes. The self-perception or the self-presentation that you are faced with people. I, I, would, I would add, again, to take advantage of fact that I'm the chairman, uh, uh, there's the spatial aspect of the violence. Every time they ask him, how far did you go, it's twice the size of this room. Even if it was this size of the room, the distance that anybody could move in this now fairly crowded place was very small, and crowding creates violence too. And so that becomes an interesting part of it. In any case, uh, it is my pleasure to thank you. Thank you.